Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Science is done in various and interesting ways across fields and even within fields as they evolve. And this is in response to different scientific contexts and challenges and results in different cultures. And actually, of course, one of the interesting things about interdisciplinary science is, is that you're trying to bring some of these disparate cultures together with interesting consequences at times, with interesting being one of those words that's in quotes. So what are some of the differences in scientific context that give rise to these different approaches? Well, here's a, I don't mean this to be exhaustive or definitive, but just some, some thoughts about that. First of all, fields obviously differ in to what extent they're mathematical or, or uh, quantitative. Uh, fields differ and differ at different points in time into the range of experimental or observational techniques that are available. In other words, how many options do you have when you're trying to, exp to make progress? Do you have only a few tools in your toolkit or do you have a lot of tools in your toolkit? Are you capable of having strictly controlled experiments or not? Uh, what comes to mind here in particular is I'm t talking about uh, medicine or, or uh, biomedicine. Uh, you're dealing with this extraordinarily complex system called the human body. And while we know an awful lot about it and excitingly are learning an awful lot more, there's still a system whose full complexity is beyond our grasp to really understand. And so doing reproducible experiments is still a tricky thing. And, very, and you end up in a very different approach than you do in some place uh, like physics where much more is amenable to, if you do it in your lab, I can do exactly the same thing in my lab down to the 15th significant figure. One very important factor is the state of knowledge. Is it preliminary or mature? And of course, fields differ an awful lot in that, in that regard, and that changes what you're struggling to do. Are you just refining things, or are you, and I shouldn't say just, in a, and I mean that in a pejorative sense, uh, are you, are you uh, in that business, or are you in the business of casting about to try to get grappling with trying to figure out what's going on? And part of that is, is related to what I was saying before, is do you have a first principles understanding of the mechanisms involved or are you still just trying to figure that out? Or in the case of emergent behavior in complex nonlinear dynamics and that sort of thing where you're, you know what the basic mechanisms are but they're combined in such a way that uh, you, you're into the, into the realm of chaos and, and uh, unpredictability over long time scales. Transformation of biology, and I'll return to this point later, uh, it strikes me as a particularly interesting current example where the whole nature of the field has changed as a result of new techniques, new technology. You now have molecular level tools and understanding of what's going on. You also importantly have high performance computing to deal with this wealth of data. And that yields a major change in how the field is, uh, is handled. And in fact, in some universities you see uh, that the whole structure of the biology program is actually being changed to accommodate this, uh, to have more quantitative emphasis compared to the way things used to be done. And as I indicated before, these sorts of changes are not without their stresses for the practitioners of the field. Say, what's the bedrock of science? Well, it certainly is the objective testing of ideas, a relentless quest for objectivity, and this wonderful synergy between reproducible experiments and theoretical understanding. If you distill that down, you end up with this, quote, scientific method that most of us were taught in school. I remember having that presented, which was the hypothesis test formalism. Uh, the problem is, is, in my view, is, is that unfortunately, at least in part of the problem is, is that in, in schools, they're still teaching it as if that's all there is to science. Science is explicitly this scientific method, and that's about it. And that's very unfortunate because there's an awful lot more to science than just the scientific method. And it also, I think, has the unfortunate effect of painting science as being a very mechanistic and dull subject, because here's this, this, this simple three-line uh, procedure that you follow to do science, and then you're done. You know, where's the creativity? Where's the fun? So let's ask that question and get it out of the way. Is a hypothesis necessary to good science? So what is the classic scientific method? Well, create a hypothesis, carry out an experiment to test it, 
see if the experimental results support the hypothesis, and as I say, repeat until publish or perish. I also sometimes think of this in, in the sense of, remember the shampoo bottles used to say, lather, rinse, repeat? You know, and that's kind of what I always thought. This is a shampoo approach to uh, doing science. So of course, as I indicated before, and you all know, such formal hypothesis test loops are a very important part of doing, doing science. But there's a wide range of fruitful and highly valuable work <coughs> which does not fit into this simple picture. And crucial to that, is that create a hypothesis quotes glosses over two critical things. One is, where did the hypothesis come from? Creating a hypothesis is, the, is, is a creative process. And as indicated in number two, creative processes do not proceed in anything like a linear fashion. So what you're talking about is science has a very important component which involves creating fertile ground for ideas and creativity to occur, which then can be turned into hypotheses and then to be tested. And in fact, I'll credit Barry here for when I talked about this a few years ago, uh, came up with a very nice uh, soundbite description of this, which was the difference between the formative and summative stages of doing science. And I think that's a, a good way of, to, to wrap it up. So, as it says here, there's a lot of scientific endeavor which is dedicated to providing a rich, fertile environment of data, concepts, techniques, theoretical tools, etc., to provide a context for inspiration to occur. As in Barry's statement, once you got your feet under you a bit so you can form a hypothesis, that becomes, shifts over into a different mode. So what are some important aspects of doing good science? And I would suggest that actually the art of posing a good question is one of the essential skills in doing good science. And that is a concept which is broader than forming hypothesis, because at least to me, forming hypothesis means you have some, def some definite list of outcomes that you expect might happen. And a good question doesn't necessarily have an accompanying list of results, it's just a good question. And I, one of the things which, in thinking about this, I think these, when I say here, the good question is relevant, revealing, and be addressed within the present state of the art, those to my mind, are really the, uh, very important to all keep those all in mind as an important definition of what a good question is. Relevant means that it has something to do. It's not tangential or irrelevant to, to the subject at hand. It really connects with something important. It's revealing, meaning if you can answer that question, you will have moved things forward. Right? It's a non-trivial progress forward if you can answer that question. And then the one that I think escapes a lot of people, especially non-scientists, about this, is that can be addressed within the present state of the art. Which means that <clears throat> questions, in every field has these, questions which are just grand, inspiring, wonderful questions that you'd really like to know what the answer is to them. And especially tend to be ones that the general public can grasp readily because it, they can connect to that. What does consciousness mean? What is et cetera, et cetera? Things like that. Well, the problem is, is, is that the state of the art is such that that's not a useful question to ask. We don't know enough to deal, I mean, it's not that it's a bad question. It can be a good inspiring question, but it's not a, a question that can, be, can give you relevant progress because you don't know what to do with it other than sit around and, and, and have semantic and religious arguments about all these things. So these are all very important. Uh, in other circumstances, science proceeds by gathering good data, or otherwise building or this rich context, which I described before. And one of the important features of that is that this is really not a random process, but especially in the hands of a really good scientist, there's a really shrewd, shrewd wisdom and, and intuition as to which direction to go and which part of the field to plow. Because in any case, you always have a, a very large amount of things that could possibly be done and the trick is to draw on your experience and to figure out, well, I think, you know, over there is probably something interesting, so I'm going to go plow around in that corner of the field and see what happens. In that sense, let's just expand on that and <clears throat> call it, when does it make sense to just have a good look around? Well, first of all, getting back to the hypothesis connection, <clears throat> sometimes you just don't have enough good information to form a well-posed hypothesis, and so you find yourself in the business of of a quest for, for more, more data or new, new theoretical frameworks or ideas to yield progress. Another circumstance is where you're at an impasse. For example, you have a irre seemingly irreconcilable conflict within the field that you're talking about. And finally, a very important one, especially as technology races along, is, is that you often have an unprecedented opportunity to gather data because of new, te new technology. 
And you know, that could be a new telescope or a biological assay or other type of precision measurement, for example. And the way I like to put that here is sometimes you can be well advised to gather data first and ask questions later. And as you'll see when I talk about the binary pulsar, that th this, this was an important driver for what we, what we did there. And I'm always worried about being mistaken here. If I don't want people going away. He says, well, he said that hypotheses aren't important. Okay. That's not what I'm saying, of course. Uh, this shouldn't be taken the wrong way. It does not mean that one proceeds randomly. There is an art and methodology in proceeding in the most intelligent and effective way, knowing where best to look and how to proceed. And it does not mean that a hypothesis test is not at the core of how science works, but it's not the whole story. So let's just talk a bit more about experimental observational surveys, in part because that's what you're going to be hearing more about in a moment. Uh, what sorts of things could you expect to get out of that? Uh, first of all, there's good old statistics. More, the more things you have over a wider parameter range, the better, better formal statistics you can do. Uh, perhaps more in, even more interestingly is sometimes you will see previously unrecognized patterns in associations once your database actually gets larger. You can hope to discover special cases and other revelatory occurrences by serendipity. And again, relating to what I was talking about before, you can be building a foundation of observations with which to think about a data or concept poor circumstance. And this is a little, th this violates all rules of presentations by being a long-winded slide with just lots of words on it. Uh, but this, this was actually one of those uh, formative moments in my uh, thinking about this, is that uh, back when the uh, Institute for Integrative Genomics was being opened at Princeton, they had an absolutely wonderful seminar series talking about modern biology that was just absolutely blew my mind. It was fascinating stuff, and I went to every lecture, and it was wonderful. The thing that really struck me, though, beyond the, uh, the interesting, well, I have to say, the interesting dichotomy between learning so much more at such a great rate, but still having so much more that you need to understand is, is, is a wonderful uh, circumstance that you have in biology these days. But in any event, was is that several of the, particularly the younger scientists who were presenting some of this work, prefaced it by saying, you know, when I started to do this, my older colleagues told me that this was just a fishing expedition and wasn't good science at all, and what the heck was I doing doing this? And it just stunned me because this is just great stuff. How, how could they possibly be criticized for trying to do this? And I talked to, to one of the biologists there, uh, and she said that this was really because biology had traditionally been based much, very much on a hypothesis formalism. And <clears throat> the fact that one would go out and just wholesale collect data was something which is very, very alien to the field. And she mentioned, that in fact, this criticism had leveled at the entire human genome project. And, but then the other curious thing was she added that my reaction was very similar to that she had gotten from other physicists when she talked about the, the genome. This is back before the human genome project was complete. The physicists she talked to always said, oh, of course, we do that all the time. And it was very uh, illuminating to me to have such a dramatic, clear-cut example of what different scientific cultures uh, think and how they think and how they proceed and it is really not the same. Even, even though they're nominally doing all the same thing, uh, the, the cultures and the approaches can be very different. So uh, let me tell you about the discovery of the binary pulsar. Uh, it's an example of the scientific process which as Linda mentioned uh, led to the Nobel Prize for myself and Joe Taylor who was my thesis advisor at UMass Amherst. And certainly of course I'm not putting this forward as, as, as you know, any sort of definitive example of how science should always be done. This is just a, an interesting case study uh, which I present for your amusement. And in fact I do hope you find it an interesting and enjoyable scientific adventure story. One of the things we need to do in science education is to put a bit more of the adventure and fun of science into it so that the kids will find it interesting because it's interesting rather than because they just have to learn it. So here we are, an astronomical detective story, the discovery of the binary pulsar. So the first question is, what's a pulsar? Many of you probably know this, but let me just run through it. Uh, pulsar is one of the many fascinating uh, members of the big zoo of objects that we have out there in the universe. It, excuse me, it is at core as, of it is, is a neutron star, which is this big black blob here. A uh, neutron star is a collapsed star that has about 1.4 times the mass of our sun collapsed to an object only about 15 miles across. This is essentially pure nuclear matter, hence the name neutron star, pure neutronium. 
uh, one of those great little statistics which I picked up somewhere along the line is, is that one teaspoonful would weigh three billion tons. So it's kind of a fun, fun thing to remember. I also think the surface gravity is, I forget, it's like 600 million G or something like that. So it's also not a place you'd want to go visit. So here's this fascinating object and out there. And some of these neutron stars have an additional interesting property, which is they emit pulsed radio emission. Well, the way they do this is, is that embedded in the star is a very strong magnetic field. It's about 10 to the 12 gauss. And what it is actually is, well, we'll get to where it comes from in a minute. But in any event, there's this very strong, strong field. You may notice the field is drawn as not aligned with the rotation axis, because these things are spinning around, but the rotation and magnetic axis are not aligned. Which, by the way, the Earth, of course, is similar in that. Our magnetic north pole is not quite aligned with the geographic north pole. Uh, though in our case, it's fortunate they're pretty close, because otherwise compasses wouldn't be nearly as useful as they are. Anyway. Uh, pulsars, you have this extraordinarily strong magnetic field in this, uh, embedded in this spinning object. You put the two together, you end up with some very messy relativistic electrodynamics, which accelerates particles along these field lines. And the upshot, which is the important thing for our discussion here, is that you get two beams of radio waves coming out of the polar regions. Uh, these beams of radio waves are very narrow, and since they're attached to this rotating object, the way we see them on Earth is as a series of very periodic regular pulses. This is very aptly called the lighthouse effect because it's exactly the same phenomenon you have with a lighthouse off, you know, uh, on a rock off, off the shore. It's a continuous beam of light, but it's rotating. So when you look at it, what you see is a series of regular flashes. So the flashes that you see from pulsars are primarily radio signals. There are a couple that emit uh, optical signals and gamma ray and x-ray bursts, uh, pulses and things. But for the, our purposes, let's just consider them as radio emitting objects. And if you look at one here on the Earth, what you see as a function of time is this, as I said, this very regular series of pulses with the time between the pulses called naturally the pulse period. Now, crucial to what I'm going to be telling you about is the fact that this pulse period is extremely stable. It, can be, it will be different for any given pulsar. They all have different periods. But for any given pulsar, this is extremely stable. And in fact, literally, pulsars are amongst the best clocks in the universe. The one I'm going to be talking about here actually has its pulse period measured to 15 significant figures. So it's very precise. And the reason for the fact that the, the, fact that the period is so regular is, is obvious once you know where the, what a pulsar is because it corresponds to one rotation of this neutron star. And the neutron star being this incredibly dense object which is freely spinning out in space, it makes a great flywheel. It's very, very stable. Now, those of you who know a little more know, a little more, know I'm, I'm, I'm fudging things just a little here because they actually do slow down a, a little bit. And it's because of magnetic dipole radiation from that magnetic field. But for the purposes and the time scales we're talking about, you can just consider them to be constant pulse periods. In fact, there's a whole little cottage industry which they pursued at UMass of, of accurately measuring the, the pulse periods and that slight period derivative and other things like that. Here's an example of where pulsars come from. And this is the Crab Nebula, as many of you may recognize. It's a glowing uh, uh, blob of gas expanding out there in our galaxy, which was the result of a supernova explosion. A supernova is how a star many times more massive than our sun uh, ends its, its short but very fast life. It, the core collapses to form a neutron star, like the one I was talking about. And the, the prompt energy release is on the same order as the entire luminosity of a galaxy. You it blow off at a huge amount of, of uh, matter, in fact, almost all the mass of the star. And you're left with this 1.4 solar masses compressed into a neutron star at the center. Now, one of the reasons I show this, besides the fact it's just interesting to know where pulsars come from, is the fact that this ex sets the other part of the stage for my pulsar search, which I'm going to tell you about, which went on, started in 1974 when I was a grad student at UMass uh, with, with Joe Taylor, as I think I said, as my thesis advisor. Uh, at that time, there were about 100 pulsars known. They had been discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell and Tony Ewish. And the uh, 100 known at that point were all known to, were all solitary stars, meaning stars by themselves. 
Now, to an astronomer, that's an interesting thing, because actually a large number of stars uh, that we know about are actually in binary or multiple star systems orbiting around other stars. So the fact that 100 of these were known and were not, none of them were in a binary system is immediately interesting, but also fairly immediately explainable because of the origin of the object. The point being that if the star that exploded to form the pulsar had been in orbit around another star, it wouldn't be after the explosion. Which, by the way, is not because of the blast effect or anything. It's much simpler than that. It's just because the explosion blows off almost the entire mass of the exploding star, and that means there's not enough mass left to, to gravitationally bind the system. As a result, the fact that there were no binary pulsars known when I started was one of those little bits of conventional wisdom. Although it's interesting that in the NSF uh, proposal that uh, Joe Taylor sent in to uh, fund the computer I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, and this study, uh, he did actually mention there, unbeknownst to me at the time actually, that pointing out that it, the discovery of a pulsar in a binary system would be a really good thing. Uh, although I think he added that basically as one of those, well, gee, that sounds great, but we really don't expect it to happen sorts of things that you put into a proposal. Well, if you're off searching for pulsars, uh, what's the first thing you need? Well, these are very weak emitters of pulse radio emission. So what you need is not an optical telescope. You need a radio telescope. And it'd also be nice to have the largest radio telescope in the world because you're looking to detect these objects at as, as many of them as you can and at as great a distance as you can. So we used Arecibo, which is the telescope shown here. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this, this is just a really wonderful instrument. It's 1,000 feet across. As I like to point out, using the American unit of measurement, that's over three football fields from one side to the other. This is a reflective metal mesh surface, which has been suspended in a naturally occurring valley. Uh, this is, the geology around here is kind of interesting. This is karst topography. Uh, if you get up on top of these little hills, uh, you find an interesting thing is you look out and you see oh, that all the hills are exactly the same height. And the reason is, is because the hills didn't go up, the valleys went down. This is all, these are all limestone sinks in the, and it was a result of underground erosion due to underground water. So they found one that was pretty much circular, trimmed it with some bulldozers and put an antenna into it. Now the, uh, antenna, the signals then of course from the universe come down, they hit the surface, they're reflected up to this receiving antenna here, and the actual receiving antenna, that's 90 feet long. We observed at a frequency of 430 megahertz. By the way, pulsars are pretty much low frequency objects. They're sort of in the VHF, UHF TV band is, is where they're strongest and where typically observed. Um, I have to always have to control myself and not linger too long here because I always thought antennas were just a really neat thing. You know, these, these gadgets that pulled signals out, out, of, out of nothing. And, um, so, and, this, and if, you, if you like antennas, of course, you've got to love this one. Uh, just to give you a little feeling, that's a three-story office building down here, just to give you that little bit of sense of scale. This thing's huge. And just one other little observation. See, I'm going to carry on just a little more about the antenna. I can't help myself. Uh, this is that feed structure suspended about four or 500 feet above the dish. By the way, the view from up here is really great, you might imagine. Uh, I'll also have to tell you the other little funny story is there are two ways to get up here. There's, you can see there's, there's some cables to go along here. There's actually a catwalk that runs underneath that. It's about yay wide. And there's also a little cable car, which is about as big as this lectern, that goes on this impossibly small steel cable that goes from the ground on the side up to the, up to the platform. And when I was down there, I just discovered that there were two types of people in the world, people who were scared to go up on the catwalk and people who were scared to go up on the cable car. Um, and then there were people who were scared to go up, period. And they were crazy people like myself. Who said, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> sought out various excuses to go up to look around from the top. In any event, um, the limitation, as you no doubt realize, of this antenna is the fact that the reflector is fixed in the ground. So intrinsically, it wants to stare at one spot straight up, and that's not very convenient. Well, you can fudge that by moving the feed antenna around. And that's what you're seeing here, is the actual feed antenna, which is here's that 90 foot long receiving antenna, uh, is attached to what's called a carriage house. And that actually moves up and down on this arc here. And this, excuse me, this whole assemblage here 
rotates on that track that way. And what this means is, is that you can actually look about 20 degrees away from straight up with some increasing distortion and loss as you get away from straight up, but still you can do about 20 degrees. Or, as you will see in some of the data I'm going to show you, it means you can track an object that passes overhead for about two hours a day. And you'll, this is an important thing you'll see in the, in the data and led, led to the, some of the mystery as to what was going on, because I can only observe an object for two hours and then I'd have to wait another day for the Earth to bring it around into view again. So if you're looking for something, you need to specify as carefully as you can what it is you're looking for. And this is just a quick uh, tour of the, a couple of the essentials of finding pulsars. Uh, first of all, I told you, so here, these are radio signals versus time. <clears throat> and at any given frequency, you have this sharp pulse, because again, actually, I should mention that I've drawn this in a characteristic way. Pulsar pulses typically are very short, very short duty cycles, like 1% to 5% or something like that. So they're pretty sharp, narrow pulses. Uh, they're separated by a period. There is a pulse width, which can vary. They aren't all the same width. And then another interesting phenomenon called dispersion. The pulse is emitted across all a wide band of radio frequencies simultaneously at the pulsar. But as these pulses travel through the very weak plasma, the weak free electron density in the galaxy, the pulses are dispersed. And what that means is, is that the pulses, which all originated in unison across frequency, end up being delayed at the lower, progressively more and more at the lower frequencies. So a given pulse will arrive first at the high frequency as indicated here, then later and later and later. Now this is a real, well actually, like most things, there's sort of two, two sides to this. One, this actually gives you a handle on the interstellar, excuse me, in, interstellar uh, electron density, which is kind of fun. It also is an indirect indication of the distance of the pulsar, the more dispersion the further away it is. But from an observational point of view, it's a nuisance because you want to observe across as wide a range of frequencies as possible to pick up as much signal as you can. The problem with doing a pulsar search is each pulsar will have its own unique dispersion delay and you don't know what that delay is going to be before you find it, just as you don't know what its pulse period is going to be or its pulse width. So you actually have in data, you have a three-dimensional search that you, space that you have to go through in addition to the obvious two-dimensional search space that you have uh, covering the sky when you're looking for something. So uh, actually when, in my Nobel lecture, I, uh, which this is based on my Nobel lecture, by the way, uh, I uh, entitled this section uh, Parameter Space, The Final Frontier, with an allusion to hopefully some of you remember Star Trek, and that's what I had in mind when I wrote that. I hope other people picked up on that. So this means that we need to do some some fancy signal processing. And the way you do that is with a computer. And I also point out in here there another critical component to doing scientific research. It's called a graduate student. <laughs> and uh, this guy, uh, he has more hair than I remember. But uh, otherwise than that, he looks kind of familiar. I think I've seen him. In any event, this, uh, this picture, by the way, was taken in the control room of the Arecibo telescope. Uh, back shortly after the discovery I'm telling you about. Uh, behind me there is a big picture window overlooking the, overlooking the telescope, which I think I was commenting earlier today. It's, it's kind of fun when you, to observe, to actually be able to see the telescope move around when you're uh, observing with it, as opposed to some things, some of the observatories nowadays where you basically just send, send in an observing proposal with coordinates on it and back comes your data. You know, it's, uh, the romance kind of goes out of it, at least for me. Some of the romance goes out of it if you do it that way. Any event, this is the computer that NSF kindly got for us. Uh, for the, and, and this, is, of course, is where, where the uh, my goodness, I'm getting old part really comes in. It's not, like I, I, I like to say, I don't feel old so much when I look at myself in the picture. I get old when I look at the computer. I feel old when I look at the computer in this picture. Uh, this was about a one MIPS machine, roughly, something like that you can imagine nowadays. Uh, it has 16K of memory. That's K, not even Meg. Um, and yes, I did know hexadecimal. You know, the fact that I had switches on the front was so that I could flip in direct machi uh, machine language instructions. The thing was programmed directly in, in uh, assembly language, 4,000 punch cards worth of statements. And uh, it was an interesting experience uh, programming a computer at that level because I had to write my own little operating system and everything else because the uh, operating system that came with the computer was just too big and too slow. <laughs> 
for, for this application. And I remember clearly after finishing programming this, which was a really interesting challenge, uh, that I was very glad that I had the experience because I now knew all sorts of things about how you access disk drives, uh, well, we don't have disk drives, but access tape drives and, and A to D converters and how you did all this stuff in, in machine language, but that I was really glad high-level languages had been created because you really don't want to do this too often. <laughs> uh, any event, so here's the, uh, com here's, the, here's the computer we used, uh, and its purpose was at each point in Sky, it, it, it searched over... Uh, half a million different combinations of period, pulse width, and dispersion measure to see if there might be a pulsar in that bit of sky. <clears throat> and if it thought it found one, it uh, uh, clackety clacked it out on this uh, teletype. And th this was, we ended up discovering uh, 40 new pulsars, which was, was pretty cool and very satisfying because that was the whole point, was to discover a lot of new pulsars. Uh, but what we're going to show you, switch to now, is talking about one pulsar, which was interest, more interesting than all the rest of them put together. And you already know the punchline here is this pulsar in a binary system. Uh, but if you could forget that you know that for a moment, we'll take you along the little, little path that was involved in coming to that realization. Well, here's the first step in the path. After discovering a pulsar, uh, or I, I, I'd write it down in my notebook, and then when I got a bunch of pulsars, enough to justify taking a whole observing session, I would go back and re-observe all those pulsar, quote, candidates to make sure they were real. And also then start gathering more data on them so that I could measure the pulse period better. And this was really just, I think, of a sort of scientific good housekeeping. I didn't really have to do this for my thesis. It's just that I had the equipment to be able to measure this better. Other people would want to know this better. So you should measure it and put it in the paper, right? So here's... Good old Pulsar 1913 plus 16. Uh, astronomers being incredibly creative uh, came up with this naming convention of PSR. I'll let you figure out where that came from. And the rest of you who may or may not know the coordinate systems in astronomy is right ascension and declination. And this is just the coordinates of 19 hours, 13 minutes, right ascension plus 16 degrees declination. Uh, which, so we have PSR 1913 plus 16. <coughs> And what I've got here is a form that I'd actually made uh, Xerox copies of to, make, to automate this process. I'm reobserving this pulsar back in August of 74, and I'm trying to measure the period better. And this was a very routine thing that I'd done lots of times before, and, and no, no big deal. And the way you do it, the one trick involved is, is that to measure a period more accurately, you basically just need to measure it over a longer period of time. The trick is, is that you don't have to watch it continuously over that period of time. You can watch it for a short period of time, go observe other pulsars, do other stuff, and then come back and catch it again before it passes out of view. The key is, is that as long as you went in knowing the period with sufficient accuracy that you know how many period pulses you missed in between, it doesn't matter. Okay. So that's why you've got two pieces here. You've got this one measurement here, and the next one about an hour and a half or so later, and the idea is you'd connect these two pieces of data together and you get an accurate period. Well, the problem was if you look at this period that was measured within each of these short integrations, hour and a half apart, they're about 27 microseconds different. Now, especially in the general audience talks, I always like to say, you know, what's 27 microseconds between friends, right? Okay. Well, this is a big problem. Pulsars, as I said, are incredibly stable clocks. There is absolutely no way that a pulsar should be varying its period by 27 microseconds over the course of an hour and a half. Well, this is, of course, the first step on a path to a Nobel Prize. But at the time, my reaction was not Eureka as a discovery, but oh, nuts, what's wrong now? Right? Because <clears throat> it seemed to me that obviously there was just some sort of, exper some sort of experimental measurement error going on here. Although, even at this point, I couldn't quite figure out what, it might, be, what might be going wrong. Because as I, I was explaining earlier, uh, and I talked about a little bit here, uh, I was intimately familiar with every last thing that computer did. Because I programmed every bit that it flipped myself. And it's not that I don't make mistakes, but if you know something intimately well, you know what sorts of errors can occur and what sorts of errors you can't quite figure out how that error would occur. And this was in the latter category. I couldn't quite figure out how, how it would get this, this, this would shift like that. 
But the obvious thing to do was to assume that it was an experimental error. And so what's the next obvious thing to do is, well, just forget about this and go and reobserve it again and hope everything gets better. Well, I did reobserve it uh, a couple of days later. And now instead of 27 microseconds, it was 35 microseconds different. So things were not getting better. Things were getting worse. Well, now my, that compulsive part of my personality starts to come into play because I wasn't going to let this one recalcitrant pulsar get the better of me. So I tried to figure out what I could do to, what could, first of all, I still couldn't figure out what could be wrong, but I needed to do something. So what would I do? The answer I came up with is that, well, I couldn't, it shouldn't be true, but nevertheless, that this is a problem, but nevertheless, the procedure I was using to take this data involved that mini computer I showed you before. And this pulsar at 59 uh, millisecond pulse period was about as fast a pulsar as that system could deal with. So although it shouldn't have mattered, I thought, well, maybe it's a time resolution problem. The system isn't gathering data with high enough time resolution for this pulsar. Go gather better data, meaning data with higher time resolution, and hope then all my problems will go away, or so I thought. The problem with that was is that I had to rewrite a lot of the software that was on that mini computer for the mainframe computer at Arecibo so that I could actually get higher time resolution. So I grumbled to myself about that and then put myself to the task of rewriting a lot of that software for the mainframe computer. A couple of weeks later, I had that job done. And confident in the knowledge that I was now about to put this problem to rest once and for all, I went back and reobserved this pulsar on two successive days <coughs> with the system that gave me the higher time resolution and dutifully plotted up the results in my lab notebook. And here's the page from that notebook. And what you've got plotted is the pulse period from shorter periods to longer periods versus time. Zero is transit, which is the, when the object passes directly overhead. And here's that, that two hours I was talking about. You can see from about an hour before transit to about an hour afterwards. And, the answer, and what's plotted here are the, the period in a fi each individual five-minute integrations. One day is blue, the next day is red. The answer should have been all these points should have been a nice, flat, straight line, because they all should have been exactly the same period. But no, they're not. Oh, nuts. So now instead of a couple of data points that don't make sense, I've got lots of data points that make even less sense. So what do we do? Well, it was actually late at night at Arecibo in my office staring at this page that something struck me. And what struck me was not what the answer was immediately, but, it, but the fact that if you took the red curve and shifted it 45 minutes to the right, it fell on top of the blue curve. And for whatever, at, at that instant, purely somewhat unsubstantiated reason, it just flipped my thinking from experimental problem to, no, it's real because there's a reproducibility to it here from day to day if you just put in this shift. So, but, what's, what, but still, what's going on? Well, finally, it came up with the answer, which in the end turned out to be quite simple, as good answers usually are, which is that this is our old friend, the Doppler effect. The pulsar wasn't alone. The pulsar is in orbit around another star. <coughs> and so what happens is, is, in such a case, as the star moves away from you, the pulses get stretched out. And as they come closer to you, they get closer together. So you end up with a short period or longer period, depending on which way it's going. And actually, by the way, in giving this talk, especially general audiences, I've kind of realized this, the pulsars actually make a, a really interesting and simple way to explain the Doppler effect uh, compared to try, you know, the usual examples with sound. You know, it's a good one because people can know what you mean when you talk about ambulance sirens and things like that. But here it's very simple because what it is is just the pulsar emits a pulse. And the next time it emits a pulse, for example, it's closer to you. So the t pulse has less distance to go. And so it takes less time to get there. So they occur closer together. I, I, and I found people uh, like students and such can catch that more quickly than, the, you, than other ways of, of trying to explain this. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so that's what I thought was going on. However, I didn't want to make a complete and utter fool out of myself by announcing that I found the first pulsar in a binary system before I was darn sure that that's what it really was. Uh, <clears throat> so what I did is I devoted all the observing time I could get at Arecibo uh, 
for the next couple of weeks to reobserving the pulsar. And I, what I set for myself as the smoking gun here was I had only seen the pulse period decrease during any given observation. If it was really in an orbit, at some point you'd have to see the, the sign change. It would have to stop decreasing, turn around, and come back. And the eureka moment was really seeing this one, this curve right here, which I'm trying to remember which date. Yeah, September 16th, 1974, a great day. Uh, here's the pulse periods. This is the same plot, short periods, long periods versus observation time. Here's the period, it comes screaming down, turns around, heads back up. And I, I thought to myself at the time, gotcha. By the way, the initial variation, which had bothered me so much, is reproduced here as the red and, uh, red and blue curves up here. So you can see that that variation of the time, which was so large and so troubling, was actually minuscule compared to what I would eventually see. Armed with this, this plot, I called up Joe, who was doing what good assistant professors do. He was teaching Astronomy 100 up at UMass. <coughs> and uh, actually, a funny part of the story uh, is that uh, this is down in Puerto Rico in the 70s, and the phone system down there wasn't very good, especially for off-island long-distance calls were essentially futile exercise. So Cornell, that runs uh, Arecibo, had installed a, a dedicated shortwave radio link, like a ham radio link, up to the offices uh, in Cor at Cornell, and then they'd phone patch you through. So I called Joe up on the, on the radio and, and told him, told him what, I, what I discovered. Uh, uh, not too surprisingly, he was on a plane, uh, fairly short order after that, uh, came down and brought along with him some other equipment that made actually the continued observations a lot easier. Because after all, the, the system I was using here was really optimized for searching for pulsars, not making detailed pulsar observations. And so back at UMass, they had equipment that was more dedicated to precise observations. So he brought some of that down and we took some more data. Uh, when he went back up to UMass to continue his professorial duties, uh, we then used the, uh, remember now, this is uh, pre-internet days by quite a bit. Uh, the question becomes, how do you get my measurements from Puerto Rico up to Massachusetts? And the answer was, he got on the radio and I read the numbers off the punch cards to him. And as I like to say, but it had good error correction algorithm because you could always say, huh, what was that? Yeah. Uh, anyway. So this is what, what I'd found, a pulsar in a binary system. Uh, we have the cartoon here of the pulsar that I showed you before, spinning around on its axis with the radio beams coming out. But now instead of sitting out there in the galaxy all by its lonesome, it's in orbit, and it's in orbit around another star. Now in drawing this, I'm, I'm using some information which we didn't have at the moment of discovery, but which is now very well established. And one of those things is that the other object has almost exactly the same mass as the pulsar, about 1.4 solar masses. And that means that the two objects have this perfectly symmetric, wonderful dance around each other. Because the two orbits obviously have to be symmetric and the same size because the two masses are the same. Uh, you also see the orbit is, is very elliptical, which turns out to be handy for where, where we're going. Now, it was really exciting to have discovered the first example of a pulsar in a binary system. But the really wonderful scientific payoff for this is starts to be revealed in this curve, which comes from the discovery paper in uh, Astrophysical Journal in January 1975, Astrophysical Journal Letters. And what we have here are those data points, the varying period points from my previous lab notebooks, turned into a radial velocity using the good old Doppler formula versus orbital phase. And this is just how far around the orbit you are. It turns out that the orbital period is seven hours and 45 minutes. Very, very fast. And in fact, also explains that 45 minute shift because it means the pulsar has gone, as, each time I got to see it on the next day, it had gone three, almost three complete times around. Okay, and back to almost where it started from. So this is seven hours and 45 minutes across here for the orbital uh, time, orbital phase. Uh, immediately you look at this and you say 300 kilometers per second. That, especially for a massive object, is pretty darn fast, especially uh, 
when you, uh, considering that it's a reasonable fraction of the speed of light. You also put together the fact that you've got a seven hour and 45 minute period and these sorts of velocities and it tells you the orbit is actually rather small. And in fact, it turns out at closest approach, those two neutron stars are only about twice as far apart from each other as the Earth is from the moon. Except this is not a really puny Earth and even punier moon. These are two objects more massive than our sun approaching that close to each other. So what do you have? You have relativistic velocities, extremely strong gravitational fields, Einstein's general theory of relativity. And that is the really sweet and wonderful uh, result of this discovery is, is that this system becomes a almost ideal laboratory for testing Einstein's general theory of relativity. <clears throat> now, one of the other things I should mention is that if you remember from your relativity courses, they were always talking about these clocks being out there that did different things. Well, it's exactly what you have here. This is a theorist dream come true. You have a clock in orbit in this highly relativistic orbit. The clock is the pulsar. And in fact, not only is it a clock, but it's actually literally one of the best clocks in the universe. You could hardly ask for better. One of the first effects that was easy to see and gives you a feeling for the importance of, of what's going on in this system is called apsidal advance. <clears throat> this is the same phenomenon as the advance of perihelion of Mercury, which was famously uh, uh, measured as a confirmation of Einstein's general theory of relativity in the early 1900s. In that case, what you're looking at is the orbit of Mercury, which is slightly elliptical, and the orbit itself rotating around in space. And it was known even by the, <coughs> by, uh, the, the turn of the uh, 20th century that after you corrected for the perturbations due to the other planets, etc., there's a 43 second of arc per century. That's about one ten thousandth of a degree per year part of the apsidal advance or advance of perihelion of Mercury, which is unaccounted for. And it was the fact that Einstein's general theory of relativity perfectly accounted for that, which is one of the first big triumphs of his general theory. Now, the difference between the advance of perihelion of Mercury and the binary pulsar system is, is that in the Mercury case, it's one ten thousandth of a degree per year. In the binary pulsar case, it's four degrees per year. So the effect is enormously bigger. And in fact, you could see the orbit change even in a month or two with crude data analysis, which is really kind of cool. One of those kind of direct observational things, as it were. In fact, the way you see it is you notice this curve has this, this sharp minimum and the relatively flat top. That's telling you it's a very elliptical orbit. The shape of this curve could be seen to change even on hand-drawn plots within a month or two because the orbit is moving around at such a great rate. And in fact, by now, the orbit has turned over 90 degrees from how we first saw it. So that was, that was a really cool thing to be able to see so quickly. <clears throat> the thing which was, the, in the end, the most exciting and, uh, and what really led one to the Nobel Prize was that we, so the system allowed us the first opportunity to verify Einstein's prediction of gravitational radiation, or gra gravitational waves. Uh, and Einstein's under, uh, general relativity, gravity <coughs> is, is looked at as a geometrical interpretation of space where you have four-dimensional space-time which is bent by the presence of massive objects. If you move those massive objects around, you end up creating ripples in the structure of space and time, which are called gravitational radiation or gravitational waves. Now, this is the, exactly the thing that good old NSF is supporting LIGO to detect. The problem is, is that space is very stiff, which is probably a good thing, I suppose, <laughs> and that it doesn't wiggle very much, which is the huge technical challenge for uh, LIGO. In this system, detect, should be a copious generator of gravitational waves because you have these two massive objects moving very close to each other. But those waves are even way below what you'd be able to detect with, with LIGO. So how do you see that in this system? Well, the way you see that is by looking at what's shown in this figure in an extraordinarily exaggerated fashion. Gravity waves, just like electromagnetic waves, carry energy and they take energy out of the orbit. So if gravitational 
radiation exists, the orbit should be spir slowly shrinking, spiraling in at a rate which you can precisely predict from general relativity. So that's something we can measure, and here's the results. This is courtesy of Joe Taylor and his colleagues who have been patiently measuring this system uh, ever since the discovery. As it was mentioned, I actually left the field of astrophysics and radio astronomy shortly after, after my postdoc and went off into uh, Princeton uh, Plasma Lab to work on fusion stuff. Uh, but Joe and his colleagues have been doing a mar marvelous job of, of a really exacting uh, bit of measurement science here, uh, measuring the, this pulsar uh, ever since the discovery. This plot is actually from discovery to Nobel Prize. Here is this coordinate. Uh, they're still looking at it not to this day, though. And what we have here is the orbital phase shift, and that's simply look at, look at some fiducial point in the orbit, and you ask yourself, when does the pulsar arrive at that point in the orbit? Does it arrive on time, what you'd expect from a fixed orbit, or is it arriving early, as if the, as if the orbit's getting smaller? And so if the orbit was staying the same size, if it w we lived in a purely Newtonian world, all the data points would lie on this straight line here at zero. Uh, the points actually are shown here along with a line which is the no free parameters prediction of general relativity, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, I should point out, you notice there's some error bars in this earliest data here. There are no error bars in the later points because it's the error bars are smaller than the points. So this is really quite a remarkable uh, demonstration that Einstein was, was right. Anyway, so there's the story. Let me just devote a, a slide or two to getting back to the scientific process issue. Uh, thinking about this in retrospect, uh, you know, what were the motivations and what went on here? Well, clearly, the big motivation for doing this <coughs> was, was a new technology available. In our case, it was a fast mini computer that you could actually, was cheap enough that NSF might sanely send you the money to buy. And of course, there was really no hypothesis other than I always jocularly sort of say, this would be a good thing to do. That was the hypothesis. A little more seriously, uh, the expected result, which was, was better statistics. In other words, finding more pulsars might shed light on their properties in physics. Uh, better statistical analysis by having not only a larger sample, but also the previous 100 pulsars had been found by a real grab bag of different techniques at a whole bunch of different telescopes. So there was no more than maybe 10 or 20 found in any one given place. And they all had different methods they used to find them. And, Therefore, the selection effects were huge, and trying to do statistics across all of them at once was really not very helpful. So we hope to find not only a larger sample, but a better characterized uh, uh, sample, uh, particularly in pulse period and dispersion measure. Uh, also, uh, using the computer was what really helped us look to shorter pulse periods. Shorter pulse periods means generally is exceptions to this, but younger pulsars. It turns out, well, there's another whole story related to that, but at the time, short periods were associated with young pulsars, and so finding shorter period ones would be considered to be quite interesting. The limitation with looking for short period ones is, is that the computational power required to search for shorter period ones goes up as, I forget the exact number, but some power of the period. So you get in trouble very quickly as you go to shorter and shorter periods, and the computer allowed us to make a good jump in terms of what sensitivity we could get, combined with Arecibo, of course. And then also doing the processing properly let us potentially go out to higher dispersion measures, which meant finding pulsars which were further away. Uh, you know, another motivation, of course, was, gee, maybe we could find some previously unknown types. Like, as I said, Joe actually, unbeknownst to me, had put in his NSF proposal, you know, finding a binary wishful thinking would be nice. And guess what? We did. Uh, there's also the who knows. Uh, I, you note that actually I put in the software a provision to detect, remember this, this system is very highly optimized towards the signature of a pulsar. Very regular pulses, narrow pulses, dispersed pulses, etc. Well, what if there's something else out there that's creating pulse radio emission that we don't know about? Well, maybe it's not regularly pulsed, and if it's not regularly pulsed, this system will just reject it completely. So what I did is I actually made a little provision in there to just look for pulses that were simply highly dispersed, which is, a, which is a, uh, a evidence of it being far away. And there had actually been some theoretical work 
indicating that maybe supernova bursts would give such pulses. So what the heck, you know, so I put that in there. And it never found anything, but it was there. Um, and then as I said before, the search yielded 40 new pulsars, so it yielded some good science even without the serendipitous discovery of the first binary pulsar. And some of that science was a better clue as to what the pulsar distribution was in our, in our galaxy, mapping out the distribution of pulsars. The interesting thing is, of course, that the pulsar quest, this pulsar survey we did, had no particular hypothesis. And it was serendipity that resulted in the binary pulsar. Thinking about it later, I realized, well, sure enough, there's actually two classic hypothesis test loops embedded in there. One of them was after the initial detection of a varying period where the hypothesis was effectively there was instrumental error. The test was improve the data quality by higher speed sampling. The result was it's still varying, and so it's probably not experimental error. Uh, an important step, of course, is the brainstorming here is to figure out what else one should be thinking about. And once I finally tumbled to the binary idea, well, that's a hypothesis. And the test is to take more data and see if the behavior is consistent with the, it being in a, in a uh, binary. And particularly, that smoking gun about the changing direction of the period variation. And the result was we got it. And just a couple other observations I just throw in. Uh, one is, is that having described that, though, you know, at the time, I never thought, oh, it's now time to invoke a hypothesis. You know, you just do it. Uh, another interesting thing to, rec to think about is the fact that the recognition that it was a binary pulsar began with seemingly routine and very dull and dutiful good scientific housekeeping. Just measuring those periods more accurately just because, well, that's what you do. You just measure things as best you can. And as I have already referred to, having an intimate personal familiarity with equipment and its behavior is often important to be able to correctly interpret unexpected results. And that's actually an issue uh, of course, for the, as, as we move into more and more sorts of user facilities where, you know, uh, good scientists, but, you know, they're working on equipment that they don't, don't personally have a direct involvement in the technology of that equipment. They just use, use it as a uh, transient. And then, of course, once we knew it was in a binary, we took more data. As uh, Joe Taylor and his colleagues have been observing this pulsar now for, uh, so what is this, 30 some odd years. Uh, and, you know, just to one final hypothesis test uh, comment, I guess, you know, all this effort implicitly retested the binary hypothesis because all the subsequent data collection obviously start, you know, it starts to still depends on a, the assumption that it's in a binary and therefore potentially test that. But it's really primarily focused on gathering a body of new data that would be useful uh, to, to study other relativistic effects or find something different that you didn't, ex didn't expect. So thank you very much. Thank you. Think forward. Think Research Channel.